Good afternoon. My name is Angel, and I will be your conference operator. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the NSP Q&A webinar. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct an interactive question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the star, then the number two. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mary Paulman. Ma'am, you may begin your conference. Thank you, Angel. And I'll echo Angel's uh, welcome uh, once again. This is the NSP question and answer webinar, and this is really an opportunity for all of you to ask questions either verbally or written so that we can have the HUD staff who are here answer those questions. And on today's call, we have John Laswick, David Nagura, and Hunter Kurtz. And Ryan Flannery should be joining us around 3 o'clock. So, and as most of you know, Ryan is the expert here on DRGR. So we want to ask if you have a very complicated DRGR question, if you could hold off till 3 o'clock. Or if it's a technical issue, um, my coworker, uh, TBA, uh, Kathy Kaminsky um, can answer some of the DRGR questions as well. So if you have a quick question, we can take it. Um, once again, I'm Mary Palman from TDA, and it is our pleasure to help HUD by moderating these sessions. So let me turn it over to Kathy just very briefly, because she wants to just reiterate for you how to do the question and answer for that. Kathy, go ahead. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so as Angel said, um, if you have a question that you want to ask verbally, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Um, and there's also the option to ask written questions. I see we already have one in. Um, and you'll do that by using the Q&A tool. It's found on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Um, if you don't see it open, um, if you don't see a text box there, uh, click on the arrow that's next to the word Q&A, um, and it will expand that box. Um, you can send a question to all panelists, and we will um, rotate between taking questions over the phone um, and uh, reading aloud the written questions that come in. And I will turn it over to uh, John Laswick to start us off with some hot topics. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, see, we told you there was life after deadlines, and you're all still alive, so... Some of you, all of you who are here today at least are still alive, so welcome to the afterlife. Um, we uh, have a couple of things we want to touch on. David's here with me, and um, he's going to tell you about the clinics we're going to have. Uh, I just want to let you know where we stood with um, uh, expenditure deadlines, and, um, and then we have informal consultations and so forth, and we've been spending uh, more time than we'd like uh, actually doing this for the last couple of months. Um, so, in SP1, there's 307 grantees, um, 39 SP1 grantees missed the deadline for 100%, which is 13.4%. Um, that was a number that was actually pretty disappointing to us because uh, while we knew that SP3 wasn't going to be great, um, you know, after four years, we thought SP1 would pretty much be done given how many uh, communities made the obligation deadline. So. Uh, so that was one where uh, uh, we were we were disappointed. Um, we have had 16 informal consultations from that group, and 23 uh, still to be scheduled. Um, and in SP2, that deadline came earlier. We only had four uh, of the 56, uh, or 7.1%, uh, miss the deadline, and we had those consultations right away because they came. Their deadline came ahead of all the other deadlines, uh, so those are behind us. And then with NSP3, um, most of those were clustered in uh, March, and 61 of 270 uh, missed the 50% expenditure deadline, uh, or 29.5%. Um, out of that 61, we've had 42 informal consultations, and we have 19 left to go. So. Um, if you uh, did miss the uh, your one of your expenditure deadlines, 
You should have uh, received correspondence from your field office uh, alerting you to that fact and allowing you some additional uh, time to get your record straight. We did have some, uh, not a lot, but a few um, uh, grantees did uh, clear it up in that time period, and I know it was on some consultations last week where there were, uh, I know at least one case where HUD, um, HUD's uh, DRGR system seemed to be the culprit, uh, but um, for the most part, um, you know, we're just missing because the ex expenditures weren't there. So, so we are uh, going to continue to um, wrap these up. We've got 42 left to go. Um, we are uh, going to try to prioritize those by size and um, uh, urgency uh, so that we can kind of spread them out um, and, and not uh, swamp the system too much. Uh, there have been some weeks here when it seems like that's all people were doing. So, um, But uh, the good news is that Yolanda has been um, uh, showing uh, support for all of our grants and has not told anybody to stop. Uh, their programs. In fact, she has told everyone that we've talked to so far to continue to move forward with the program. And I would uh, encourage you, even if you haven't had your consultation, to keep keep moving because, uh, especially if you're NSP3, you know, you've got uh, one year or less than one year to spend the other half of your grant. So, um, so you know, and actually somewhat more than half your grant, depending on where you came in. So. Um, so, in the meantime, keep moving forward. If you don't know what's going on with you, or if you think you, sh if you think you missed the deadline and, and the requirement, and you didn't get a call or something, call, please contact your field office uh, so that we uh, are not missing you, uh, and you know that you fall into some sort of a, a lost zone. So, um, so I guess in summary, uh, you know, it's been. Um, you know, we've had a lot of good success stories. Um, you know, I think that the grantees that have missed have not missed by a lot, but it's still a, a bit disappointing to be able to, you know, have to tell Congress and the Secretary, well, you know, we started out this well with the first set of uh, deadlines, but um, this past set has really kind of um, broken down a bit. So we're really not going to be able to afford to do that next year uh, for NSP3. So need you to focus and, and get your programs going. And if you're having problems and you don't have a technical assistance provider, please let us know. We still have money left to uh, to provide that kind of support. Davida has been doing most of the work on the clinics, and we have a whole bunch of them coming up here this summer, and uh, we'll tell you about that. Yeah, so, so many of you may have seen the, um, the, the listserv announcements that have gone out. Um, we've been updating it as uh, quickly as possible. Um, for many of them, if not most of them, um, the registration sites are already active, and um, you know we welcome you to uh, to sign up for them. Um, they're being offered in 12 different cities around the country, and our hope is that um, as many um, grantees, affiliates as possible who can uh, use the help um, will participating in them. Um, for those of you who may not have participated in the past, let me just give you a, a sense of what it entails. Um, basically, uh, this is an opportunity that HUD uses to provide face-to-face um, -face contact with uh, grantees, uh, answering questions, troubleshooting issues. Um, what we do is we bring out our technical assistance providers um, who are um, experts in various subject matters, and based on how you have completed, how you have answered um, a variety of questions about your interest, topics of interest, we will have a subject matter experts there um, who can speak to those um, subjects. And, and address your um, questions, um, troubleshoot your issues. In, in the past, we, we've done them at hotels, and um, they, they've been pretty big. This time around, uh, we don't have that luxury, and um, most of them will be offered at uh, HUD field offices or locations in the uh, federal buildings in the field. Um, 
Some of them are larger than others and will be able to accommodate um, pretty large groups, but there are some that, that, that are fairly small. So that's one of the reasons why we've had to limit the number of atten attendees for each um, um, grantee to uh, two to three. So I, I encourage you to, um, to participate, especially if you are able and they are near to where you're located. Um, if you'd like to participate and, and they are not accessible to you, um, maybe they're just too far, then, then let us know that and, and, and let us see if we can figure out another way to, um, to support you. Um, we have tried to get a little, little farther around the country this time, but um, you know, we can't be everywhere, unfortunately. Right, 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 right. So, 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 so ch check out the site, and, and, and we're here on the webinar today if you have any questions about this as well. Yeah, or, or requests. Um, right, and, uh, you know, there'll be HUD staff at all of these, too. David and I are be, will be uh, at all of them, or one of us will be at all of them. And um, so, you know, we'll, we'll probably do a little thing in the morning where we kind of summarize the issues that uh, are you know, breaking or whatever, but mostly it'll just be the one-on-one -on -one kind of conversations that you're used to from, from previous uh, uh, clinics we help, so. Right. I will add, in the past, we've offered a series of work workshops slash seminars on, you know, some of the basics. Uh, it's, it's more of like a, 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 a lecture on a topic. This time around, uh, we don't have that luxury, but if you feel like you could use some of those basics, then we do have uh, spillover rooms where uh, we can have some of those discussions and, and offer guidance on um, um, various various topics of interest. Yeah, I think uh, for those of you who've uh, participated before, I think you know that we've we've been pretty flexible. We've tried to kind of uh, accommodate you know any need that we possibly can, and I think in this case. We're going to be a little less topic driven and a little more, you know, sort of one on, you know, a little customized, I guess, and we'll continue to try to customize uh, as the need uh, arises. So we'll, we'll do our best, and, and you know, we are looking at other ways of providing some of that basic training, like uh, online and some other things, too. So, um, so the closeout process, uh, we, uh, we're going to do a little longer presentation on this, but I just wanted to let you know we have been waiting for a key uh, review here in headquarters, and we have finally uh, received that. And so um, that we, so what we have to do now is uh, make some revisions in the in the document. Um, the, the closeout notice that uh, went through last year for uh, CDBGR and some other programs. Um, is uh, and, and I guess it's uh, disaster recovery uh, as well, CBG, DR. Um, they're in this uh, notice as well, so there are several offices that have to work on it, and uh, we'll have to go back. And then we still have to, uh, once we've gotten everybody at HUD happy with that, uh, go through the Paperwork Reduction Act process, which uh, is a 90 day process. And so um, it's it's looking like we'll be lucky to have this notice published by the end of the fiscal year in September, um, maybe a, a little sooner than that, but um, uh, which means that you won't be able to close out your grants until that time. And um, I think, you know, to reiterate, most people are not ready to close out their grants because you have to have all your properties occupied, all your demolitions demolished, um, all your paperwork done. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's unlikely that you are really missing out on anything. Uh, there's a handful of folks that uh, just talked to Knoxville, Tennessee last week. They, they're finished and all their projects are occupied. So, so we, there are some folks out there, but um, you, you really are kind of not out anything by not closing this out. Um, the, the grant money stays, pretty much stays NSP money uh, post-closeout. Um, uh, pure nonprofits from from NSP2 will have a little bit more flexibility, but there's only uh, 14 of them. So, uh, for the most for most of you, it will continue to be NSP uh, an NSP program uh, to the extent that you have program income. And um, I, I looked last week, and we were close to 950 million dollars in program income uh, in all three of the years. So, 
close to 600 million in NSP1, and um, and uh, over 250 million in NSP2. So, so that's really going to be the source of, of uh, you know ongoing funding for this. I would also mention that there is a, a proposal in the president's budget for 2014 that would create a, a 200 million dollar fund to do NSP-like activities. Uh, through a mechanism that's uh, similar to the 108 loan guarantee program. So um, this, uh, we, we really don't know how that would work yet, but there is uh, a little bit of uh, uh, hope there. It would be a competitive program, um, so not everybody would get a shot at it. Um, it focuses on demolition. And yeah, and it, and it focuses on demolition and, and rehab. So now obviously with demolition you're not going to be able to use uh, like a, a bond program or some kind of borrowing because you're not going to get any money back on those. So that, you know, a lot of all these details, you know, if it gets approved, uh, the details will have to be worked out, but I did want to mention that. The budget also still includes the uh, project rebuild uh, program, uh, a $15 billion uh, proposal that I um, believe Ma uh, Representative Maxine Waters has reintroduced in the House. Um, and so um, I don't, I can't really comment on the, the, the prospects for that, but um, you know, we, we remain hopeful that we will continue to have some uh, support to uh, continue your NSP uh, activities uh, post closeout. Um, and then, uh, and you know, so feel free to ask questions on that uh, through the course of the uh, webinar. And then finally, uh, we just uh, have had a lot of interest uh, uh, expressed from different uh, folks, uh, both in, inside government and from uh, our grantees inside the federal government and from our grantees about uh, how to do economic development in conjunction with NSP. It might be, you know, it's, it could be with in conjunction with other programs as well. But we are looking for uh, examples. Uh, we've all, we're only aware of a handful of uh, cases of NSP grantees that have done some sort of economic development activities with uh, NSP funds. Uh, so, for example, in NSP 1, uh, it was possible to do um, some, uh, some kinds of public improvements that could have led to uh, economic development, and you could do area benefit sort of activities, uh, shops that provide services to low, moderate, and middle income people. Uh, with the closeout notice, we've added low, moderate, or middle-income jobs as a national objective, and I think the folks are uh, kind of curious. Well, how how might that work, and what are the best uh, kind of ways to think about that? And so, before we get too far down the line, uh, Jennifer Hilton on our staff here is going to be um, coordinating some uh, some guidelines and and uh, suggestions and best practices. And so, if you have an example of a project that you've done with NSP funds or alongside NSP funds even, uh, we would appreciate your uh, just writing a short note to Jen and uh, at this uh, email address here and so we can, you know, draw on the strengths of the NSP program uh, as, as a model for other communities. So that's all we have. Before we take the questions, so we might as well uh, move to questions, Mary. Um, well, we have one written question uh, so far, and I'm encouraging other folks to type in. Uh, the first one is from Lynette Thomas, who says, I have a home that I want to rent out to veterans. We are in the remodeling phase of the house. Should I set it up for the five veterans as a single room dwelling or a studio apartments that can accommodate the five veterans? And if so, what are the regulations? And uh, she and Kathy have been emailing, so she also had a follow-up, which was, I need to know what are the requirements as far as specifications and room sizes to accommodate each veteran to suffice for that apparently she's got VASH vouchers. All right. So um, I guess I'm wondering if she's got NSP funds, because it doesn't really state that. She's I'm just a um, landlord. Yeah. So okay. she's got NSP funds. It might be one answer. Um, I would think, though, that she needs to consult with whoever's uh, providing the, the certificates uh, through her local government. Um, that's that's going to be the place, typically, where you're going to find um, 
you know, room sizes and uh, minimum occupancy requirements and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know that there's a, you know, that it's an either or. I think it, you know, there's going to be some trade-offs in terms of space if you try to convert a structure into separate uh, units as opposed to individual bedrooms. You you may lose some capacity but gain some, uh, you know, gain some higher rents. So uh, it's a little hard to 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 uh, troubleshoot this one from afar, but um, if there's a specific NSP element to this, I, I'd be happy to talk about it. If if there's not, though, I really would suggest that anybody in this situation really needs to consult with the with the funding agency, and you know, if it's a local housing authority or a local nonprofit or uh, or whatever, that you you need to go through that route. I, I am not that familiar with the the emergency shelter and, and other. Um, program requirements, so I, I, I'd be, I mean, I don't mind making it up for NSP. <laughs> but, um, yeah, great. I, but one other thing they should probably be looking at too, John, is local zoning codes, right. um, particularly when you have unrelated individuals living together in a property. Right. Um, many municipalities regulate that quite heavily. Right. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I, I guess I was I, I was assuming, maybe incorrectly, that the money is coming through a unit of government. I realize that's maybe not the case. So yeah, but it, but those are local kinds of considerations, and and what may uh, be ha perfectly acceptable in one town um, might not work just next door. So um, you really need to find out. But if there's an NSP element to that, uh, when that, just let us know. Um. We do not have any other written questions, so let me ask you, Angel, do we have anybody queued up to ask a question verbally? You do. Your first question comes from the line of Julie Green. Hi, this is Julie Green. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, actually, I did not have any questions. I just thought I'd listen in today. Um, Get some answers then. <laughs> we uh, we spent all our NSP one money and we spent almost all of our NSP three money. So I think we're oh, good. Where are you? pretty good. We're in Trumbull County, Northeast Ohio. Uh, okay. Um, but I, I heard what you were just saying previous uh, about zoning codes, and my ears perked up because I'm working on our impediments to fair housing. Oh. They sh they should not have any restrictions on how many unrelated people live in a house. That's a fair housing issue. Uh, so. There may be some physical issues, though. You know, we don't know how many how how big that house is, for example. So. Yeah. Right, but that's that's a thin line to cross. But anyhow, I appreciate your uh, holding these and um, your uh, online help is wonderful. Uh, the NSP um, online website and the DRGR. I'm slowly learning it. As soon as I learn it, I'll I'll be completed with it, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Well, that's, you know, that's government, you know. We don't yeah. have any useful skills beyond the... <laughs> <laughs> but, Thanks, um, Julie. Well, so how's the economy doing up there? Are you, is it getting any better? Or? Actually, Trumbull County, um, the most recent unemployment rate is 8.3%, which is still a little bit higher than uh, the state average of seven and a half percent, but we are doing better because of the Marcellus and Utica shell industry, and also because of the um, various um, manufacturing facilities that are um, arising out of that. So uh -huh. I don't know if you've heard of the V and M Star project. It's the largest project in Ohio. It's actually in Trumbull County. It's a $1.3 billion um, expansion project for a rolling um, steel mill pipe. They're producing pipes for the um, oil and gas industry. Oh, good. Amazing. Good. Yeah. So it is, I, I think it's, you know, obviously we still haven't recovered from 1977, but <laughs> when the steel mills closed, but we're working on it. Yeah, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> but we could really use some more money for demolitions, I'll tell you that. Yeah, your congressional representatives tell us that too. So We have thousands in the Valley, thousands in Youngstown and Warren. Yeah. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you.
Um, we have two more written questions, and both of them related to DRGR, but the first one seems to be a bit of a technical issue, so let's see if, Kathy, if you can handle it. If not, we'll leave it for Ryan. Um, it comes from Dave Wolf, and it says, I am having trouble with entering expenditure info into DRGR into the QPR. It is giving me an error message stating that program income drawn is greater than program income received. Our draw is approved and our program income verified to be zeroed out. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Dave. We've had this happen a few times um, over the past, I would say, month or so. It sounds like it possibly is a financial data drift error um, issue. We've, it's, it's been happening with PI draws. Um, what I would recommend you do is um, submit a question on ask on the one CPD ask a question. I'll I'll put the link up here um, uh, in the chat in just a moment. I'll send it to everybody. Um, but if you could pull a take a screenshot of the error message that you get and uh, possibly pull a report showing it should it, if you see a discrepancy between what your QPR is showing and what is in the uh, reports module, um, that's a pretty good sign that there's a data drift error. But we can, someone on the help desk can kind of work through that and uh, we'll get it to the contractors to make a, a data correction. Um, but that has, that will have to be done on our side if that's needed. Uh, HUD will have to do that. Right. So, yeah, so that data drift is a, uh, a term of art that has been uh, recently developed. Uh, to uh, describe some mysterious set of circumstances that produce chaos in your results. And um, so those, uh, as Kathy was saying, there's some of these, like it sounds like maybe this one, um, really are not your fault and just need to be corrected. We have done several corrections that um, have fixed this, the, the condition for most grantees, but there's still some uh, uh, glitches out there. So don't, don't get too frustrated. And um, if that doesn't work, um, that we can get Ryan or Jim uh, Yarden work with you. Uh, the reason we're we're asking to hold on these until three o'clock is Ryan's uh, home with a sick child today, and he's hoping that he'll be on, taking his nap by three o'clock. So we'll we'll see if that works out. Otherwise, we may have to uh, bump these till the next time, or more appropriately, have you go through the uh, DRGR hotline uh, or mm -hmm. ask, ask a question. So. And I know that they were running data corrections every Thursday, so if this is something that you're getting sent last Thursday, um, you know, it's possible that it could get um, corrected when they run the next one. They're just doing an automatic one. But, um, you know, I know that it prevents, when you're getting that error, it prevents you from doing anything else or from submitting your QPR. So um, you're not alone, though. Other folks have seen that, and most of them are getting worked out fairly quickly. So. Ryan and Jim have been doing great with those. Right. Well, here comes another DRDR question for you, Kathy. Or even for John and David. Um, when entering in performance measures in the QPR under an activity that was set up for home buyers, if you lease purchase the property, when you when should you enter into the performance data into the QPR? At the point of lease or at the point of final sale? And this question came from Valerie. Well, um, so you'd actually do both, right? We, so we, we treat them as, as two separate activities, all right? In, on, on paper, it's called a lease purchase, but in, from a reporting standpoint, it's a rental that later becomes a, a, a for sale. So um, I'm not sure what you have to put in the narrative, but I know from... Um, from a um, national objective standpoint, you'd classify it as a rental for the period of time that it's being rented. And if it does indeed become a, a for sale, you you would then um, um, add add that component to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, but don't wait because you know you're going to have to. I mean, it might be another year and a half for you know so, or maybe more, depending on how your your market works out for the for the purchase part to kick in. So. Um, you, you want to show that as an occupied unit, and, and you could even probably close out your your grant and then have the have the transition to ownership take place. So, okay. John, that's a that's an excellent point, 
that, uh, you know, if you have an opportunity to fix things in uh, DRGR, now's the time to do it so that you don't have to deal with it um, later down the road because that's something you're going to need to do to close out. Um, Angel, let me ask if you have any other folks queued up before I read the next written question. We do. You have a question from the line of Stella Chu. Hi, Stella. Hi. Um, thank you for holding these sessions. I have a question regarding program design. Uh, our program is designed that a developing partner will take title of a foreclosed home, rehab it, and resell it to a low and moderate income buyer. At the time the property is purchased, a promissory note equal to the acquisition amount is secured through the recording of a deed of trust. The cost of rehab is on a reimbursement basis, so it is not secured by the promissory note. However, it is documented uh, internally. At the time when the property is resold, most likely the resale price will be higher than the amount appeared on the promissory note. So will this create any problems since the resale price cannot be uh, higher than the total project cost uh, based on my understanding of NSP regulations? Because I know that some other grantees do include the entire development cost uh, as part of the promissory note at the time when they purchase the property. Right. So let me just ask you on, this, on the rehab then. You're, mm -hmm. So you're, you're lending on the money to um, purchase the property and you've got a note for that. Right. And then you're paying out money on the rehab and is that getting added to the note somehow, or how are you, is that, that's not really secured in any way at this point, or? Well, it's not secured. Our uh, city attorney's um, understanding is that because it's on a reimbursement basis, because in the agreement between us and the developing partner, the partner is supposed to front the rehab cost, and we will reimburse them. That's, that's why the uh, attorney believes that we don't need to have it secured. Yeah. Okay, so um, so your question really is about when you get to the the end of the line there, and the house is finished, and and you've got a, you think your total, you think your appraised value is going to be lower than your total development cost? Um, or, or is it? Well, a yeah, it is, but but it just the, the resale price will be will probably be higher than the promissory note amount. That's Right. right, but but will the resale price be lower than if you add the rehab to the uh, the promissory note? Those two costs? Oh yeah, it will be lower. It just the rehab cost is not secured. Right, right, yeah, Document. yeah. So 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 from fr from HUD standpoint, uh -huh. you don't have to um, secure the the rehab costs oh, okay. in order to. Um, tabulate what the total development costs are, okay, right? Great. You do need to have documentation showing that these expenses were actually incurred, that, that, that the work was actually done. Okay. Um, but um, the, the, the reimbursement mechanism that you're using is, is, is appropriate. Okay, wonderful. So Thank you is, very much. Yes. Uh, is the developer then going to get a fee that's based on the you know, some pre-negotiated fee or something, or like what happens to the money? Do they do you get the money back and they get the fee, or or do they get to keep some of the um, proceeds? They no, they don't keep the sales proceed at all. They get a fee, a fixed amount fee or uh, a profit and overhead based on the rehab amount, but they don't get any of the sales proceeds. The city gets it back. Okay. Well, yeah, I think that sounds okay. Is that so? Has that been working all right for you? Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. For NSP three, we've met the um, fifty percent uh, expenditure deadline, and in NSP one, we met the hundred percent deadline. Good. So. Good. Okay. Yeah, that that sounds fine. I mean, I think you okay. know we've had more problems with developers, um, you know, being able to keep the proceeds. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it's you, you really got to do your underwriting. In this model, you're really kind of you know, the, the developers you know, really kind of locked into you to provide the funding, and, you, and you're just lending it, basically. So that's a, a little bit more of a secure kind of a, I mean, overall secure uh, type of situation. But you're right. I mean, you can't, if your appraisal is 
lower than your, your total development cost, you can't sell it for higher than the appraisal, but you can sell it for lower than, than the appraisal too. So what you need to do is match it to the income of the family that's purchasing the house. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Angel, do you have any additional callers queued up? If you would like to participate in the interactive question and answer session, oh, please press star. Oh, sorry. Well, we do have one written question, so let me read that. Um, it's from James Hines. I am closing out a project. It has a 20-year affordability period. Can the affordability period start with project completion as per the getting the certificate of occupancy from the municipality? Uh, I believe it starts with the occupancy, whether either the sale or the or the lease. Um, yeah, that's that's the way I understood, John. Yeah, I was going to say okay. So Hunter Hunter's been tracking that a little more closely, but I mean because you know we've we've seen houses that are you know perfectly nice houses that just can't sell for some reason, and um, you know they might sit sit there for six months, and so that's not really you're not really meeting a national objective with that. You only uh, start to meet a national objective when you when you put a family into the unit, and, and that's when your clock starts. Um, we don't have any additional written questions. Angel, do we have any folks on the line? There are no audio questions at this time. Gentlemen, we've run the gamut. Well, I don't know about that. There's still 100 some people that haven't asked. I know. We're running a special on questions, folks. Two for one today only. <laughs> so we're only and we're having really good answers today too. So you better get them while they're hot. Um, I know that you got a burning concern. If you don't want us to say your name, we won't say your name. If you want to, if you want, if you're a little shy about this or you're a little worried that the IG is listening in or something like that, don't don't be afraid. We can we can protect you. So. Can we offer question and amnesty like we do in training? Question and amnesty, yes. That's a that's a given. That's true. We do offer that. Um, okay. So no 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 question will be used to create a finding against you. So. Okay. Well, James um, emailed in and said that his question was related to a rental project. Does that change any of your comments or? No. Okay. Um, so once again, it would be it would start when they rent the unit. Yeah, um, I, I kinda, I'm not 100% sure how it works with a multi multi-family. If, you know, if it has to achieve stabilized occupancy before you start counting, you know, because you're going to have, I mean, you're not going to have, you know, 150 different affordability periods. Uh, so, um, uh, if I could ask somebody in our home program, I would, but uh, the only one here right now. We'll see if we can find something. I'll, I'll write to my friend Earl and see if he can join us for a second. All right. Well, we do have another question uh, from Glory. Uh, for a home buyer loan activity under eligible use E, is each loan a separate activity number in DRGR, or can the loan program be grouped as one activity number? Uh, that one that Kathy knows the answer to? I'm sorry, John. Kathy, know that? I don't, off the top of my head. Um, Kathy? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I can look into it. Okay. Well, um, we can hold that until. Uh, oh, we can hold that one for we Ryan. We can hold it for Ryan, yeah. I'm tracking all of these DRGR ones to, so we can bombard Ryan when he joins us. Um, Angel, do we have anybody on the line who'd like to ask a question? You do have a question from the line of Deborah Belter. Hello? Hey, Deborah? Hello? Yes, hello, how are you? Hi, thanks for taking the call. Sure. Um, we are um, intending to complete um, five or six rental rehabilitation single family properties. And um, sell them, and I use the word sell loosely, uh, we intend to take proposals from entities who would then own, manage, and operate the properties 
and lease them throughout the affordability period. And we would have a deed restriction and um, forgivable deferred payment loan on the property. Uh -huh. um, like a non-profits or something like that? Well, either non- or for-profit. The Citizen Advisory Task Force says, let's go with for-profit so we could keep it on the tax rolls. Um, so my question is, um, do we have to scrutinize the, um, the the income that the new owner would receive as a private entity as long as the properties are rented to income eligible households at not more than 30% of their income? Um, some of these, at least three of these properties would be uh, very, you know, the low income with the 50% area median income, and the remainder would be up to 120%. So the new owner would not have a fixed rental rate, um, right. and it makes it difficult to make projections. And there are no other subsidies. We are, in order to add to the affordable housing stock, we are saying that they cannot use other subsidies with this. Uh, well, yes. I mean, you do have to make some sort of a calculation about the reasonableness of the of the, of the return. Um, you know, it's going to depend on what they put into it. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it's hard to project exactly what the rent will be. Uh, but you can project the rents on sort of the upside. Um, I mean, if somebody's you know if somebody's at 120 percent of median and paying a rent that's commensurate with with that income. And there's then there'd be a range down to you know 50% or whatever, and then another, you know, I think for the for the below 50%, you could use the, uh, I think we've allowed in the NSP program through the home program to use the low home rents uh, for the 50%, and you know there's probably less likelihood that somebody's going to be, you know, getting extremely rich on 50%. Uh, Rentals, but uh, you still you, you are going to have to perform some sort of a, of a cost uh, feasibility analysis, and you know to show that you know under certain sort of reasonable assumptions about what the rents will be, that the that the buyers will not um, uh, you know be be you know, getting a return that's unreasonable in the marketplace. Um, uh, and then I guess you could have some sort of a Provision that um, you know that you would review these properties every once in a while and, and take a look at it. And if the rents do go up, you could have some sort of a you know provision for uh, repayment or something like that. But that that creates quite a bit of work for five or six units. So mm -hmm. um, I don't. And this is NSP three, and we are. Um, um, of course, going to do a review of, of the proposals to see right. you know, how they have this in mind. And um, the idea is to sell the portfolio together so that losses on the low income units would be offset by a right. little bit of profit on the other units. So you're going to sell them as a package? Yes. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. And I think that. You know the point you made is is good. Then you know that so you, you you suspect the ones that are the low income units are probably you know going to be inclined to lose money, and the other ones are, might might make a profit, but it'll be offset somewhat. So that that could be part of your calculation. Mm -hmm. you, if you do you have a technical assistance provider now that's working with you? Um, no, this is under the state of Florida program. Okay, well, you, I mean, you can still request technical assistance as a sub-grantee uh, of the state, and um, this is the kind of thing that, you know, I mean, we can give you some sort of a general notion over the phone here, but it's just going to take some sitting down and kind of crunching numbers and, and helping you think it through. So I would, uh, you know, just go to the uh, 1CP resource exchange and put in for some technical assistance, and, uh, I mean, we can get you started with, uh, you know, a couple of days of remote technical assistance, and that might be enough, uh, you know, just to kind of help you, um, you know, think it through. I mean, the calculations aren't inherently complicated. It's just, the, you know, sort of what are the trade-offs in your in your community and, you know, what kinds of things you need to worry about, that sort of stuff. All right. We just want to keep it as simple as we can, um, and we are almost finished with 
the rehab and acquisition process, so we are going to be moving pretty soon into disposition. Well, we got some good TA providers, so yeah, we're not. We, we would try to, you know, help you keep it simple too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Are, Angel, are there any other questions on the phone? There are no further audio questions at this time. Great. Thanks. I'm going to go back to um, the question earlier that I found an answer to um, about home buyer loan activities um, and are they entered into DRG or separate activity numbers or grouped as one activity number? And, um, you know, I think you have to consider this just like you would any other activity and if the uh, uh, responsible organization is the same and um, the national objective is the same, um, you can, it can be one activity. Each loan does not have to be its own separate activity number in DRGR. So, but those same minimum requirements um, as all the other activities would apply to this one. Okay. And then we have um, another question here. Um, can you discuss how communities have handled granting developers the funds to create affordable housing opportunities? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I think there's, uh, you know, we, we just heard uh, one way, uh, which would be to sell completed units, um, and you, you could sort of, you know what the rents you're likely to be, be getting. If you want to develop, typically we've seen um, developers uh, who are, um, you know, who, who acquire units or, or, or work on units that the, that the grantee owns. Um, and they have the responsibility um, to uh, to do the rehab. Um, in, in most cases, in many cases, to do the uh, lease up, and in some cases, to do the the long term management. Um, there's sort of two general um, uh, approaches in terms of financing that. One is with grants. One is with loans. Uh, we just had a, a question uh, a few minutes ago from a community where they're doing it with loans. And so that gives you uh, sort of more uh, muscle in the deal, so so to speak. Um, uh, but it it is uh, you know it means you're processing more paper mo most likely than than, uh, than when you turn it over to a developer. Um, I think the biggest thing in in any of these cases is just ensuring that the costs are reasonable and the work gets done, um, and that you know the properties are managed well in the long run. And um, you know, so you can have agreements that call for all that, but it always still requires you to get in there and you know be working with the developer and looking over their shoulder to make sure that they're that things are going right and uh, and you know doing some you know allowing yourself to do some inspections post occupancy just to make sure that you know the the properties are being kept up and that sort of thing. Um, but I think the place where we've seen the biggest stumbles are in the uh, in the underwriting, um, and uh, you know, in some cases, not giving the developer enough money to complete the project. In some cases, giving them what appears to be too much, um, and you know, how much is too much is a, is a subjective term, as we learn every time we talk to our auditors. So, um, so you know, it's a it, it, there's no kind of one set formula that works perfectly every time. It, it depends on the the capability of your organization, um, the capability of your developers, uh, and and you know how much money that you have to, to be working on this stuff. But um, I'd say in the long run, you know, you you really want to make sure that you, you're working with a good team. So uh, while you're not even required to procure developers in the same way that you might procure a, a you know a, 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 an equipment contract or something like that. Um, most communities do some sort of a request for a qualifications process because what you're looking for in a developer is the ability to do the job um, and to uh, and to do it you know honestly and uh, for a fair price and uh, you know so you have to underwrite the individuals and the firm and then you have to look at the project itself and make sure that you're putting in uh, enough money to get a job done get it done well but not so much that the developer is uh, starting to buy, uh, you know, extra Mercedes Benzes. One's okay. One's okay. 
<laughs> Mine's mandatory for developers, as far as I know. Right? Okay. If that doesn't answer your question, though, let us know. All right, we have um, a request for some examples of items that are acceptable when generating program income expenses. Um, you, you mean what? You mean what? Can you spend program income on? I, I guess I'm not really sure about that term. Or well, what's considered programming? I don't know. Items that, are, yeah. That's, um, I'll see if I can get some clarification let's, let's on this say, one. Let's say this, for starters. I mean, program income really just becomes the same as grant funds. Um, so it has all the same rules uh, as your original grant funds do. So. Um, you know, you have to spend the program income first, um, and it has to be spent, obviously, then on eligible activities that meet a national objective, and so forth and so on. So, so that's kind of the general principle. But if that's not um, what you were referring to, uh, give us a little more detail. All right. Um, Angel, do we have any other questions on the phone lines? There are no more audio questions at this time. Okay, we just got one more written question. Um, and we, I have a DRGR question that I'm holding to since we're getting close to 3 o'clock too, but we'll do this one first um, and maybe Ryan will join us in a few. Um, so yeah. we, this question asks, NSP3 rental program, um, the local housing authority is the subrecipient who will be owner and property manager. What is the permissible fee the subrecipient can charge for property management? Um, flat fee, percentage of rent, or only true and actual costs? True and actual. Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So, who? It's a subrecipient. It's a subrecipient that is the owner and property manager. Right. And they know. are the local housing authority, apparently, as well. Well, so you could. I mean, so you can charge exact, you know, operating costs, and I mean, they're, but then, you know, subrecipients are going to have administrative expenses too, so they could charge, you know, legitimate um, expenses on their own part. Um, so those would all be considered activity delivery costs, right, and whatever those costs are that they incur, they can, they can, they can charge. Um, what's it, what, you want to tell them about the 3%? Uh, yeah, we we have allowed a three percent um, allowance for indirect costs that for places that don't have an indirect cost plan um, that would cover things like um, utilities and rent and overhead and things like that that aren't normally covered in a in a uh, things that are normally covered in an indirect cost plan, but those are pretty expensive and may not you know the scale of this program may not. Be, be worth it. So, is this is this something? Are we talking about long-term occupancy here? I, I, I'm, so, um, but the problem you have is is that they're they're classified as a subrecipient, right? So, a subrecipient is really no different than if the grantee were owning an and and uh, managing a a rental property, right? Um, in that case, they can charge whatever. Um, Expenses they incur managing the property. Um, they'd have to keep timesheets and 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 whatnot. But um, they couldn't do it on a fee basis because they are not a private um, property manager. Yeah. Well, um, if if part of the question though is um, let's say there's a, you know ten thousand dollars a year worth of. of uh, of, of revenues, you know, I'm just making up a number, and their expenses add up to eight thousand dollars. Then um, it's it's permissible for the grantee to allow a subrecipient to keep excess revenues to use for other eligible activities. So, I mean, if that's what you're trying to do, you, there are ways to do that. You have to, you would have to do that through an agreement, through your subrecipient agreement. Um, but um, you know. If, if you're just looking at controlling costs, then uh, yeah, David is right. I mean, subrecipient is just as is, you know sort of works in the same shoes that a unit of government does, and, and in a sense plays by all those same rules. Uh, 
Sean, let me ask um, just on that point. You know, for a number of years in the low-income housing tax credit world, we've used um, incentive management fees as a way to use up excess cash. I mean, would that be acceptable here, um, given your comment about they could keep any cash left after expenses were paid? So the incentive is to do what? To keep the cost down. Well, so then they just get... So they keep the cost down and they keep the difference? I mean, so what does that yeah. prove? The difference would just be program income. Right. So the question is, could they allow them to get, you know, create an incentive management fee in their agreement with the grantee, or should the money just come back as program income? Um, well, I, I don't know. Our auditors are not have not been very um, loose on these things, I, I'll have to say. So, um, but, I mean, I, I, I think it would be safer in our program to say, you know, an incentive management fee that would be used for additional, you know, X, Y, and Z that are eligible activities as opposed to uh, additional Mercedes Benzes for the managers, you know. So that's, that's the concern. Well, since it's the local housing authority, I would hope that they would be getting Mercedes Benzes <laughs> for the program managers. The publicity just isn't good. Well, it's different with a nonprofit to some extent, but you still have, you know, you still have to account for the money, and you still have to show that what it's going for is, you know, eligible activities and, you know, reason and at a reasonable level. So, I mean, I, I'm I'm not opposed personally to the idea of incentive, you know, fees. I, I like them, but. Um, you know, it's something that you could do for a developer a lot more easily in this program than you could do for a subrecipient, I think. Yeah. Oh, Kathy, do we have any more questions? Yeah, and I see a couple hands raised um, and just wanted to clarify. If you raised your hand on WebEx um, and you want to ask a question verbally, you need to press um, star 1 on your telephone keypad to get um, queued up so that you can be unmuted to ask your question. Um, we have a couple of other questions. Um, uh, this one might be a question for Ryan, but let's see if uh, Hunter or John know the answer, or David. Um, how do we record specific projects by address where both NSP1 and NSP3 funds were used without counting the unit twice? Are they? Oh, you actually do count it twice. You put okay. it in both, in right. both and then Ryan has another term that he's made up called uh, deduplication, um, <laughs> which uh, which sifts through there by address and and then um, takes out the the duplicates. But right. uh, so yeah. But if you add up the contributions from each program, it should total out to the one house. Is that not in the Oxford right, Dictionary? So Oxford. You know, funny, I'm on. I'm on. By the way, I was just in Oxford about a week ago, and I looked it up. And I did not. No deduplication. No okay. Right. All right. So we know that. So they were. But we've been trying to figure out what what Ryan's middle initials for. At first, we were guessing it for delightful, but now it's now now it's down to whether it's deduplication or DRGR data drift. So. <laughs> All these both. How's your son doing? Doing all right, doing all right. Good. He's uh, watching a movie right now, so peacefully. Hopefully, he'll stay that way. <laughs> okay, so uh, so we have a window of uh, uh, opportunity to ask Ryan some questions here on DRG. Or do we have one that was still hanging from before? Uh... Yeah, we have a couple. Um, one that I didn't even ask yet um, that I was holding for Ryan is. Um, DRGR does not allow demographic reporting on demolition activity. Um, we have a demolition activity where NSP funds were the, were the only NSP funding to the project, and then new construction was non-NSP funds. How do we record these funds as used um, as benefiting low income? Well, I mean, it, first of all, if it's a part of an activity that, would, that progresses, you know, immediately to a rehab, and, you know, John DeVee, you folks, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I would think that, that you know, even if it's only NSC funds, even if the NSC funds are only going towards demolition, I consider that as just a, a part of the rehab. They're just happening to pay for the demolition portion. Um, so if it's progressing directly to a rehab, I don't see why it couldn't be counted as a rehab. If it's and then you could, go ahead. Yeah, real, very directly, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it would have to be, you know, as a, like, they have the full sources and uses, and NSP happens to be doing the demo part, but, you know, as a part of this whole process, this whole redevelopment process, but, um, but let's, let's just say that they're, they're not doing it. They're not counting it as a rehab. Let's just say it's as a demo activity. They, that's as an area benefit. Right. So that would be, they'd be, you know, they'd be pulling out the um, census tract blocks that show that the area that they're serving is low mod. So that's how they show that it's, you know, serving low mod folks. Right, right. So I guess, you know, we haven't really seen uh, a lot of cause for concern among the demolitions. Uh, you know, most of them are pretty hard hit areas in the uh, upper Midwest. Uh, there are some kind of spot uh, demolitions that are done. You know, if you're doing one in, a high, in an upper income area, I, I guess you, you might have a problem there and we could look at, you know, what the subsequent use was for. But, um, in, you know, almost every case it's an area benefit. And since you can go up to 120 percent of median, uh, that's, you know, that should be enough to cover just about any neighborhood you're tearing down houses in. All right. Um, and just to check in, too, we left uh, earlier, Ryan, we took a question um, about it sounded like somebody was maybe having the financial data drift um, issue with uh, PI drawn greater than PI received uh, um, on their QPR. You still want those submitted on AAQ so we can track and follow up with those? Uh, they on, they can. Question. I mean, I would, I'd recommend because we're doing these automatic reconciliations every couple of days or so to give it a day. Actually, they're taking place on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's, so um, if, if it happens to be any of those three days and you still see it the next day, then please, you know, submit it. Um, if, or if it's a situation where you're trying to draw something right away, and then I would actually send that to the drgr underscore help at hud.gov email address and just say urgent um, in, the, in the subject line. That way, somebody can take care of it even more quickly than the AAQ. I was I wanted everything to go to the AAQ system back before we had this ongoing data correction, so that I could keep track of everything because so many were coming in from different sources. So, um, but now that we have those, I would just recommend you know either waiting it out or if it's super urgent, sending it to the, the DRGR email. Uh, the other thing is that we do have we're currently in testing for an emergency release, which should, I believe that's going to be. Uh, it's going to go through in the you know, early part of May, so within the next few weeks. And that should deal with this whole data drift issue, and I never want to hear that term ever again. <laughs> data drift. I'm with you. Um, we, uh, we also had a tip. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard this before, uh, that uh, Warren submitted and said they kind of found a kind of fix um, if they don't sub submit program income funds on the same voucher as product funds. Um, they don't get the problem. They're doing two right. separate draws. I think that's something I mentioned on the last call, I think, but that, that is sort of that is a way to avoid it in the first place, at least in, in most cases, I think. Um, and it has to, I don't know, it, it just has to do with yeah, the, the mixture of the two fund, funding sources, funding types, and that's mm -hmm. causing some of these issues. So, yeah, I mean, if you separate them out, you might, you might miss it all together, might not even encounter it in the first place. Okay. Um, I'm going to look back and make sure we didn't miss any other DRGR issues for you, Ryan, um, um, and check in. Angel, do we have anyone on the phones? You do. You have a question from the line of Ebony Baylor. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Thank you for hosting these questions. Hi, John. Hi, Naveed. Um, I have a question about um, just We've been administering our NSP funds internally. We didn't use a sub-recipient. And fortunately with NSP1, we were able to meet the 25% set aside with a senior project. And with our NSP3, we don't have a, a project to, you know, to uh, meet that set aside. And we want to try to do what we've been doing, which is provide home ownership opportunities to families, but as you guys know, that the 50% below AMI group, that's just, it's typically, right. typically a home buying population. So I wanted to know if you guys are aware of any 
uh, collaborations or any project, uh, any activities that any other grantees might be doing that might be able that have been working. I've I've heard um, rental come up several times, and I, I think on one of the other webinars there was a conversation about lease to own that came up, and I'm just trying to get an idea. Um, you know, maybe some ideas on some things that we can do to help that particular population. Uh, yeah, well, we, I mean, I think when we started out, we all had concerns about whether uh, ownership was going to work. I mean, most grantees in NSP1 started out down that path with uh, home ownership for even for low-income people, and, and honestly, m many of them backed away from it. They they just were having trouble making it work. Habitat, um, you know, and I, it depends on the the organization in your area, but Habitat has made that work. Um, so that's one way to do ownership, but you know, they have a whole program of, you know, sweat equity and, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of filtration that goes into their process. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, special needs housing is another one. Um, you know, we're seeing quite a few veterans programs. Uh, uh, Florida has some really cool, um, you know, homeless veterans kinds of programs that they've assisted with NSP funds. Uh, uh, but, you know, just the, also just the kind of typical um, rental, you know, just a, a you know, standard rental opportunity kind of thing with a, maybe a, you know, a certain percentage of a development, um, you know, is, is assisted and, and the rest is, is market rate or something like that. Those, yeah. those always work pretty well. Yeah, yeah. R r rental is by, by far what most of our grantees are doing to address the, um, the set-aside requirement. Um, for those that are doing uh, for sale housing, you'll, we'll, we'll see that they have to um, place a much deeper subsidy into the housing in order to make it work. Right, and we've seen that, and we've something that we've contemplated also. I mean, we've kind of scaled our purchasing to be on the you know the lower end, probably like seventy to eighty thousand um, dollars just for acquisition, and even lower than maybe when we put some more money into it. We try to keep the the cost on the front end low, so that way. You know, it's low going into the home buyer. Right. But uh, the other challenge I think that we're having too is uh, getting these folks qualified for mortgages. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, and the, in some cases, the grantees are financing the mortgage, similar to what Habitat does. Right. Right. And that's something we have to. Yeah. Want to talk about? I guess we may have to have the conversation. Another thing too is the, um, you know, with the lending requirements being tighter, and a lot of these families don't have the required down payment, and of course we can't. As the seller, we can't provide down payment assistance. So. No, no, but you can provide secondary financing, right? To help bring down the overall. Well, you can't provide it if it's an FHA mortgage, but if you're not using FHA, I don't know that there's there's not an NSP prohibition against that. So, are you doing a lot of FHA stuff? Yeah, a lot of FHA. Um, you know, it just really depends on the buyer and their their credit, of course, that makes the terms if they're eligible or not for those type of those other loans that are not FHA. Um, but probably 90% of the loans that have come through um, for the properties we've sold have been FHA, so they have that required three and a half percent. Right, right. Well, I mean, if you're looking for a you know a single family kind of product, but a, a rental uh, structure, you know, there's there's scattered site rentals. I've seen some pretty successful ones. Um, Reno Housing Authority, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland uh, have both uh, used NSP money to provide funds for the housing authority to do scattered site rental uh, programs. That's you know labor intensive. You know it can be cost. You know it can be costly. Because the other thing you have with the with the low income um, buyers is you know this sort of you know maybe you can get them to qualify it and maybe you can lower the price enough, but you know they're still. You know, there's still just you know one one hole in the roof away from insolvency. You know, I mean, you know, they they just don't have the the resources to deal with the shocks. You know, of a, you know a furnace going out or whatever. You know, and right, right, right. And that's the concern too. I mean, we we look at that going in and right. So, but I just wanted I appreciate it. I just wanted to see if there's anybody that has successfully done that. Um, I know it's been a it's, been talked about on several webinars of the challenges that have been had. I just wanted to see if anybody successfully yeah. found a way to do it. I, like I said, I hear rental 
talked about quite frequently, and I, I didn't think that that was something that we wanted to do, but I know to meet a national objective, to meet the objective on this NSP3 money, we need to, you know, figure out exactly what our approach is going to be. Well, right. no, there's, there's, there's no... Uh, there's no discouragement of rental housing. I, I, I would say quite the opposite. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe we've been, we've all been surprised. I think as the program has evolved, you know, how it's gone from an almost all single family uh, to, you know, we're I don't know around 40 percent um, all the family now. You know, and most of that's rental. So uh, there, there's really no, you know, we're, we're not discouraging that at all. And in, and, you know, in, mo in most cases, it, it seems like the way to go. So. Um, yeah. Even with lease purchase, you know, I mean, you're just, you know, today's market, you know, you you, you got to be saying to yourself, well, the family within a couple of years or so is going to have to move from whatever situation they're, they are now to be able to qualify for a mortgage, you know, are they, you know, do you really think they're going to do that, you know, I'm, those programs haven't been easy either, so, um, I, I mean, I don't know, unless you're really dead set against rental for some reason, I, I would take a, a harder look at that. Mm -hmm. The, the, and, and if there are any callers who are listening that um, have some suggestions, please um, just, just, just raise your hand and, and share it with us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay. Yeah. And your next question comes from the line of Ruth Simmons. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Ruth. Um, we here at Minnesota Housing have a, a subrecipient model. Uh, so... At this time, we're looking at a few strategies to um, improve uh, the speed of our program and uh, hopefully uh, reach closeout as soon as we can. <laughs> okay. um, so one of the things that we're looking at is we've um, reanalyzed the high-need target areas that we've been serving to see how high-need they are and therefore we pre-categorize um, the highest need target areas at this point. And we plan to um, make some recommendations uh, to our board um, to move some program income that's uh, surplus in some other target areas um, to the highest need of recipients. Um, in those high need target areas. Uh, we also are looking, and that in one case will help uh, some of those subrecipients that are still revolving a lot of program income to reach a, a closeout date sooner than, than where, where we're looking at them to end. And that will focus more resources in the higher need areas. Um, and then we're also looking at um, those are recipients that actually need more funds to finish projects that they have begun. So we're making, looking at making recommendations on that end as well. The one thing that I'm, I'm a little looking for some suggestions here today is uh, drawing down program funds that, that um, is basically trapped in the high need areas as well. So, so program income or this is the original grant allocation? The original grant allocation and, because and how to get to it. Yeah. Yeah, how to get to it because um, you know, we could be giving them the high need areas a, a, some some income that could, you know, really continue to stabilize those higher need areas, but then we also want to close out um, and let them continue to revolve program income. But we want to be able to use all the original grant funds that was allotted to us and not lose any of that. Is this NSP3 um, that you're talking about? or NSP I'm sorry? NSP3, NSP1? NSP1 only at this time. Okay. Um, yeah, we... Um, we reached 100% expended last year in March, so and there's been a lot of program income in our program. So we're now at this point in this middle period after the end date of NSP1, we're in this middle period between end date and closeout date, which we still see far, far in the future because we still have about 150 properties that are still 
not finished and in progress. And we have um, another 67 land banks. So we still have quite a bit of projects still to, you know, get through. So, but so are the properties um, not moving or, you know, is the work just taking time? It's just taking time, yeah. It's just taking time. Yeah, it's and just it, it, sub-recipients are in different stages, you know. Gotcha. And then how many um, sub-recipients are you working with? Um, well, we started out with 21. We're down to 13 at this point. Gotcha. Um, and and as you give uh, funds to the sub-recipients, are you allowing them to keep the funds and recycle them to do more work? Or are you uh, receiving the funds as they are um you know incurred or as we as the sub uh, you mean the sub recipients in the future that we would like to um, uh, program income that they earn now where does that go does that come back to state? right now they get to recycle it okay. um yeah right now we're not taking it in we're just reporting it on drgr um and they get to recycle that um oh, yeah. and Therefore, a few of them have made quite a bit of program income, and they continue to make it. And therefore, um, therefore, our need to analyze is this: is this revolving still making a lot of sense to continue there, or should we move it somewhere else where it makes there's a higher need? You have some flexibility to to move uh, funds around. I mean, if if they're not, you know, if they're underutilized in one area and they're needed in another. Um, you know, and you're talking about approved areas. I mean, it's it's it seems to me like it would be at most a a, a, a local amendment. You know, that you could work out with the, the field office there. Um, the other way to think about it, almost kind of sounds like what you're doing a little bit now, is to to allow to to have the sub recipients establish revolving funds, and then. Um, but I don't know. Well, I guess they still have to spend their own. I don't know. I'm not, maybe that wouldn't help since they all get to keep the money anyway. They still have to spend their own program income before mm -hmm. they draw uh, program income. Um, I, I think you need to sort of sit down with your whole, you know, kind of your whole map and your whole universe of, of subrecipients and, oh, well, you know, who needs what and who's who's oversubscribed and who's undersubscribed, and then talk to the uh, our Minneapolis office there about, uh, you know, how you could shift some of that around to make it logical distribution. Right. And and, and if well, you only have 13 now and you're looking to draw down additional funds, you might consider bringing on additional sub-recipients who, um, who can help draw down those funds. Um, uh, the, the need is pretty great in just the target areas that we've identified. So I don't think that we have an interest in in reaching out to more at this point, we want to really focus what's left in in the highest need areas. But the the reason for my question was just to try. I mean, we've already had in mind meeting with our sub recipients and discussing this plan, um, and we have a good idea of who has surpluses and who needs funds. Uh -huh. um, but um, the only puzzle that I'm really running into is drawing down the program funds because they seem to, at every point of the plan, they seem to get trapped under program income. Well, let me let me say this. Um, for NSP1 and NSP3, um, they are uh, they are called in a term in Washington, that we use here in Washington, no year funds, which means that they don't expire. So, I mean, worst case, you know, you know, if it takes you five more years to to get through all that program income and get back down to the original grant amount, you could still theoretically, you know, you're you're not in, in jeopardy of losing them. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that that's the way to go, but you know, ultimately there's no sort of ogre at the end of the world there. So. Right. Oh, okay. So I must have misunderstood that in a, a previous webinar because I thought that once we reached um, a decision for a closeout date, that at that point, um, only program income funds would be allowed to revolve in the future after closeout, well, and true. any program funds would be cut off. Well, that, it's, it 
it's true, but we're not going uh, I mean, to. We're not going to close you out. Well, yeah, we're not going to close you out until you're pretty well spread out. The only the only kind of that we would close out of the of your line of credit will be you know ch spare change that's left. You know, so but there's no requirement to close out at any particular date either. So. Um, so you have time. I mean, I'm not suggesting you use all that time, but, you know, there isn't any urgency either. Okay. Well, that helps a lot. So do the rational thing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay. And there are no further audio questions at this time. Uh, we have two written questions, though. Um, and the first one is, and they're actually both from the same person, but the first one is, at what point do we stop recording program income to an activity in DRGR? Um, ever. <laughs> I figured as much, but figured I'd have you say it, John. Well, right? let's put it this way. At some point, DRGR will convert over to IDIS, and then you'll be reporting it there. <laughs> Until that mythical date arrives, um, and that'll be a date drift, I'm sure, that we have. So. Um. Okay. The, the, the one thing we could say is that once you've closed out, then the reports won't be quarterly. They'll be annually. Um, so that'll, that'll give you a little bit of relief. But um, Yeah, yeah this money will, re will, will remain NSP money for, you know, the indefinite future. Okay. Um, the second question is back to the demolition-only activity. Low mod area benefit does not give us credit for low income group assisted that was counted as part of the 25% required set aside for the 50% AMI group. Right. That's not a, yeah, that's a housing requirement. So none of the demolition funds uh, can do that, can, can contribute there unless, you know, you go immediately from a demolition to a, a construction of an affordable housing unit and, and count the demolition as part of the rehab. But um, you know, for this reason, we have uh, uh, we have approved some demolition waivers. Congress limited demolition to 10% unless HUD granted a waiver, and the most that we have ever uh, awarded uh, granted in a, one or two cases was 65%, because up to 10% of the funds will be used for uh, general administra administration, and at least 25% have to be used for the low income set aside. So you know, it's just not. It's a separate program from demolition, for the most part. Well, that wraps up all the written questions we have. Um, Angel, another check with you. Is there anyone who's raised their hand to ask a question? There are no audio questions at this time. John, anything you would like to add? Uh, no, I, I think we're... Uh, we're, we're okay here. I think uh, 90 minutes, that's not bad. Um, so we appreciate everyone's uh, participation. And uh, we've got another one. Hunter can probably tell us when the next one of these is. Uh, I know there's at least one on May 7th, but uh, is that the next one, Hunter? Or probably doesn't have a schedule in front of him. So. Um, we, uh, well, let me just to say that the last slide in the deck talks about uh, answering a very quick survey monkey where we would like to get everyone's feedback on today's presentation. So when you go to log off, this will automatically pop up. And please answer it. Um, it's very helpful uh, for us to understand is the format working for you or is there something more that we should be doing that will assist all the grantees to get their questions answered. John, last word? I see from my calendar, at least it looks like we have uh, rescheduled the marketing and disposition strategies to next Thursday, the 2nd of May. So I think that's uh, that was one that we uh, were not ready for a couple of weeks ago. So I think that one's coming up. Um, and, you know, I, any number of places are having uh, difficulty selling units, whether it's uh, getting financing or the market's going on them or whatever, so that's, uh, that should be a good one. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for all the participants. Take care. And thank you for your participation in today's NSP Q&A webinar. You may now disconnect.